may be seated. All right, let's go to Mark 16 tonight. Mark chapter number 16. There was a man in one of D.L. Moody's meetings once testified that he lived on the Mount of Transfiguration for five years. Well, Moody bluntly asked him in return, in that time frame, how many souls did you lead to Christ? Well, the man hesitated. I, I don't know. Have you led anybody to Christ? Moody persisted. In which he replied, I don't know that I have. Well, said Moody, we don't want that kind of mountaintop experience. When a man gets up so high that he cannot reach down and save poor sinners, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. Wow, pretty pointed, isn't it? You know, I think one of the greatest things that we can experience is God using us to lead somebody to Jesus Christ. That God would use us to, to lead somebody to the Lord. In fact, if we don't lead a person to Christ, to be used to share the gospel, to be one of the, the sowers or the, the planters of the waters, if you will, I think it's one of the, the things that will bring great joy in the Christian life that cannot be experienced otherwise. I believe those who seek to be a witness will find that there is an inner joy that will pr propel them to do more which will result, of course, in God using them more. There's a joy, if you will, with being a, a soul winner. You know, what's one of, what, one of the, I guess, most exciting things is when you get a good opportunity to witness somebody. When you get a good opportunity to, to tell somebody how they can be saved, and they're responsive, and they, they maybe ask questions, or, or you, you, you feel confident that you might have another opportunity later on down the road, that's exciting stuff. And it's exciting to be used of God. And I think there's a real joy for the soul winner that wants to reach somebody with that message. But again, for that to happen, we have to be conscious of the fact that opportunities do exist all around us to do so. We simply just have to take advantage of them. Mark 16, verse 15, I think it's a well-known verse for us. And he said unto them, Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Tonight I just want to talk about some practical things that we can do so that we can be, as I put it, being soul conscious. Let's pray. Father in heaven tonight, I pray that uh, our lives would be soul conscious, that we are considerate of those who are around us who do not know you as Savior. We ask that the Spirit of God would speak to us tonight, and through, especially just through these practical tidbits that we'll cover. I pray that it will be a helpful time that you would get glory and praise. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a preacher by the name of Leonard Ravenhill. He's written a number of different things about the subject of revival and prayer and soul winning. And He rehearsed a story one time in one of his books about a, a man by the name of Charles Pierce, or Peace, a notorious criminal in England who was executed back on February 25th of 1879. Just before his execution, an Anglican minister half-heartedly read to him uh, from what was called the Consolations of Religion. He said this to this man who was about to be uh, executed. He said, Those who die without Christ experience hell, which is the pain of forever dying, without the release which death itself can bring. Charles stopped the minister and he said, You know, sir, if, if I believed what you and that your church say about what you believe, even if England were covered with broken glass from coast to coast, I would walk over it all, if need be, on hands and knees and think it a worthwhile living just to save one soul from an eternal hell like that. You know, that's a passion. When people realize, you know, what hell is all about, what really it is, and, and how significant of, of, a, of a punishment that is for those who go out into a Christless eternity. You know, as we've seen in past messages, God has a real heart for getting people the gospel, for people to come to salvation. He says in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish. That means uh, go out into a Christless eternity, uh, spend forever in hell, suffering the eternal consequences of their sin. God's not willing or desiring that any would go there, but that all should come to repentance, right? To the acknowledging of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 4, it says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge 
of the truth. The heartbeat of God centers around the, the lost getting the message so that they can respond to it. Now we know that not everybody's going to respond to it, but at least they have the opportunity, and that's what we're, we're talking about here tonight. For people to be saved, though, for people to have that opportunity, there must be someone who will go out and tell them. And that someone is someone who has experienced the salvation experience. And tonight, if you've had that experience, then you are on active duty. Just like I am on active duty to distribute the message far and wide. We as God's people have been called to be witnesses. I spoke about that last week in the hallway. <laughs> about being a witness. You could call us, the Bible calls us ambassadors. A common phrase often used is soul winners. Whatever you want to use as a term, however you view it, it's people who are just simply trying to get people God's message of redemption. Our text communicates that bluntly, clearly, and precisely for each and every one of us. God wants us to be active and aware of those without Christ around us, and as I've mentioned already, seek to be a witness to them. In our text, Jesus said, the first thing he said, the first word he said was what? Go. 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 This tells me that God doesn't want me, or you, passive about spreading the gospel, but active in making my best efforts to do so. Go. Go. Do we realize tonight that never in God's word does it say, sit and wait for them to come to me. Sit and wait for them to ask me. Now that may happen, but there's more of a directive for going out, isn't there, than waiting for some to come in. There, there, there is this going aspect. It, it doesn't speak of a passivity. It doesn't speak of, well, you know, if somebody happens to stumble upon or ask me a question or notice, you know, certain things about my life. And again, they may do that. And there, there are those examples that it does happen. But most people will not do that. And hence, God tells us, Jesus tells us to go, to go, to be an active witness. I like how it's put in a, a parable Jesus gave in Luke 14, verse 23. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. I like that verse because it tells me I am to go out and everywhere and anywhere and compel them to come. Come to Christ. Come to the house of God so they can hear about Christ. And we, need, we should really ask ourselves individually here tonight, how much compelling have I been doing lately? How much compelling have I been doing? Do I do any of it? We should all be doing it. We really should all be doing that. Really, anything less than that it really equates to disobedience. And we want to obey our Lord. Until everyone has a chance to hear the gospel, we're in need of spreading the message every week to every creature that we can. And that's clearly expressed by our Lord, isn't it? Very, very much so. Go ye into all the world. <laughs> Go, all of you, into all the world. Tonight I'd like to give some tips some helpful tips, hopefully, I believe will help those who, who are trying to reach out. Or, or maybe tonight you're like, I don't even know where, where to start. Or maybe I've forgotten <laughs> where to start, I don't know. What are some things I can do that will make me soul conscious, that will help me be prepared to get the message out so that others may be saved? I'm going to give you about nine things tonight, and they're all short, so don't worry. We won't be here till 10, maybe 9.50, but not 10, I promise, amen? Just, just to put some of you at ease. 
First off, let's talk about gospel tracts. Somebody gave me a statistics. I've heard this float around before that 80% of people who come to Christ have done it through the printed page. There's always some probably, especially in the day and age which we live, that so many people in some respects gets, they, they receive a gospel track or, or, or they've read a gospel track that either plants a seed or sows the seed or waters the seed, whatever the case might be. And this church does not have a shortage of tracks. We, we don't. We order thousands of them. And probably in a given year, we go through tens of thousands of them. I'm sure over the course of our, our existence, we've gone through a, a million or two. I'm sure easily uh, with all the different distributions we've done. And we've done this to sow the seed the best that we can. And they are available to usage for free. We won't charge you anything to use those things. Now, there's a number of us that we've done our testimony track. And, you know, we'll, as you use them, we'll, we'll buy more of them. I think there's actually a couple boxes back there, a couple of them that we do need to order some new tracks on. And that's good. I'm glad that they're getting out. These are, these are good things. We, have, we actually even have some foreign language tracks of, of some different languages that we've brought back from some of the outreaches that we've done. But one of the greatest things I think we could do that is just so practical and so simple is always just keep tracks on us. I mean, this, is, this isn't really a hard thing. Do we keep tracks on us? You know, I don't know what you may carry. You know, gals, they often have their purse, and, and maybe, maybe it would, you know, that's the black hole. I don't know what, it, what your purse is like for some of you. Some of them is, is really clean. I don't know, whatever. I'm sure you can find the gospel track. It's, a, it's the light of God, so that should that'll help, <laughs> help you find it. Amen? Yeah, thank you. Regardless. You have, you have a place to carry. You know, I like to keep, I, I've got a, a wallet, and I, I usually keep a handful in there. Um, you know, whether you keep it in a pocket, a jacket, back pocket, whatever. Uh, try not to crumple them up too bad, okay? Hey, here, here's the gospel, you know. Uh, no, the whole, the whole point here is simply this. That kind of stuff helps you be prepared. Have you ever had an opportunity with somebody and you realize you didn't have a track? Oh, God, I hate that. I hate that. And it's like somebody who, who actually is somewhat interested in it is because of my negligence or my lack of self soul consciousness. I, I wasn't prepared. You know, it, it, that's something that's very, very easy for every one of us to do. It's just have some with us. I'll, I'll bet every week we would be able to give out more than we realize. We really probably could. Just with various places that we go, you know, grocery stores, gas stations, things like that. Sometimes you're, you're not able to give them out every time because, you know, you've got people coming in right after. But, but you know, one thing I, I have found helpful at a, at a gas station or a grocery store or whatever, if I can get a little conversation even going with the individual, you know, they, they seem to be a little more open to taking something. You know, I've had people, uh, you know, uh, respond positively that way, if you can get a little conversation going with them. But just having, having something with you, being prepared like that, that's just saying I'm soul conscious and I'm prepared to reach out to somebody. And like I said, we got them all back there. Well, it's half empty now, which is a good thing. That means they've gotten out. But we've got a whole load more. Using those things, you know, take advantage of that. Now, don't be, I, I remember one person I knew years ago, he, he went, I, he, we, he grabbed a box of what we, they're called chick tracks. Some of you are familiar with what those are. Oh, I'm going to have these. And, and it's just like, well, no, why don't you just take what you get out in a given week? You're probably not going to get that whole box out, all right? Those were very expensive, by the way. They're far more expensive than what we've got. You know, but if you can get a bundle out in a week, great. If it's 10 in a week, great. But, it, but just having something on us, something on us that we can sow as we go. 
Because the more we sow, the more we'll reap. Not to mention, too, if you get a witnessing opportunity, some of those are good Bible studies. You could sit down and talk and talk somebody through whatever the case might be. But gospel tracts, pump them out. Obviously, be conscious of, you know, don't do them in places that they ask you not to do it. And, and oftentimes you can't do it in parking lots and, and things like that. But, you know, if you get some contact with people, hey, pass them out. Pass them out. It's a good thing. It, it, it's, it's a way we can distribute the gospel very easily. By the way, you'd be surprised how a gospel track spreads around and where it actually ends up sometimes. Sometimes the initial person you give it to isn't the person that reads it, but it's somebody that's connected to them. You just don't know. Those seeds travel. I, I don't understand it sometimes. But it, it's amazing to see. Number two, build relationships. There's a, there's a phrase that's been used before, and, and I'm sure many of us here have heard it. People don't care what you know until they know that you care, right? Well, building relationships with the people will allow you to gain their trust and also give you, and gaining their trust gives you an opportunity to give, the, you'll receive a hearing, if you will. You know, we live in a very, in a day and age, especially now, that trust is at a, probably a low. It's not been seen in quite some time in our country for various reasons. But if people get to know who you are, and realize, okay, this isn't some, some quack, but this is somebody that legitimately cares and is kind and things like that. You know, that, that's, that gives you and I a precipice in which we can get into the opportunity to share the gospel with them. Now, I'm, I'm certainly not against cold calling. I've done plenty of that over the years and will continue to do so. But statistically speaking, more people come to Christ because of the witness of those they personally knew, people that they knew. There was an author, his name was Tom Rainer. He, he wrote a book called Surprising Insights. And it was a bunch of statistics that he put together, but, but he had one that was kind of interesting to me in relation to what we're talking about here. He said 57% of previously unchurched people chose a church because of relationships they had with the people within it. Think about that. The relationships that they had with the people within it. Who do we know or try to get to know that may give us an opportunity to share the gospel? Building relationships with people. You know, that's one of the things that we've been trying to do with these international students is try to build some relationships with them. Some of you have had the opportunity to do some of that kind of stuff. That's good. But there's other people that you can take, you can consider, you know, people at work, in your neighborhood, even family members, are just Go out and find somebody new. <laughs> but try to build those relationships. This is one way that we can be conscious of people's souls and we can try to reach out. Number three, obey the Spirit's promptings. Go to Acts chapter number eight. I think there's a great example here in Acts chapter number eight. Philip, here, one of the, he was one of the original, we believe, deacons uh, chosen for, at the church of Jerusalem. Well, he's spread out now because of the persecution done by Saul. And he goes down to Samaria and he preaches Christ in the city of Samaria. And what happens? There's a good revival. People respond. It's a tremendous thing. But guess what? All of a sudden God does something. He says, Philip, I need you to go down to Gaza. <laughs> now Gaza is a desert. Nothing there. But God knew that he was going to intersect this man with another man we, call, we know as the Ethiopian unit. We call this a divine appointment. Do you realize tonight that God has divine appointments for each one of us? Probably every day, but at least uh, every week with somebody that you and I will intersect their life. And it may be just for a brief moment. It might be something that, that opens up a relationship that lasts longer. I don't know. But in this case... It was with a man who's going to see his life change. It was this, that was this eunuch. I'm just going to read part of the, the passage here in Acts 8, verse 26. Here, Philip has gotten the call, and he's heading down to Gaza. 
It says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, arise, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he rose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch, of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to the, this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him. Notice, uh, don't you like the response by Philip? He didn't lollygag, he ran, he went after it. This is, this is somebody with some passion here. And heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? <laughs> and he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so opened he not his mouth, and his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? And then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. You know, isn't that interesting? What do you know? There was a guy who was actually reading Isaiah 53, talking about the prophecy of the Messiah, and he had questions, and, what, and, and it was neat how God just brought Philip from Samaria and brought him all the way down to Gaza to intersect this man. That is just such a coincidence, right? No, that's a divine appointment. That was because Philip was listening to the leadership of the Holy Ghost. Last night we had a great prayer meeting. Appreciate folks that were on last night. And we had a number of testimonies given of people uh, getting these promptings of opportunities and, and the results that came out of them. Some were more elaborate than others, but, but if we would just be obedient to those sometimes. I imagine we've all missed some of those. <laughs> that you felt kind of the urge to give a track or you felt kind of the urge to speak up and you just kind of held back. I think we're all guilty of, of doing that. But may God help us to obey those promptings more readily, regardless of the response. May we be faithful in that. Because you never know when you might stumble upon an Ethiopian eunuch. <laughs> or you never know when you might stumble upon somebody that, that's open-hearted that on the surface might not look that way. May God help us to obey. Sometimes we stumble upon a person at the right moment. <laughs> it's amazing sometimes. Some of the things I, I have heard over the years of, of, of somebody just even being reached out to and they say, you know, I was just thinking about you or I was just thinking about this or I was just thinking about that. And it's just like, you, you, you're, you're, that's an exciting thing because you feel like, God, wow, I being the way the Lord led me. Sounds a lot like something Abraham's servant said when he was looking for Isaac's bride, who would be Rebecca. He was under the leadership of, of, the, of God, and, he, and this, is, this was Abraham's servant. He said this, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left me left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth, I being in the way the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. That phrase, I being in the way the Lord led me. In other words, he was submitted to what God wanted him to do. And, and, and he just followed the leadership of his master. And as he was in the way that God had him to go, he, dis, he found, in this case, he found Isaac's wife, Rebecca. In our case, it might be somebody out there that is, that is open-hearted and ready to receive the gospel. Or, or you're going to be used to plant a seed or water a seed that's already been planted. But we've got to be willing to obey. If we're obeying, God will lead us to opportunities. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. Sometimes in what we think are less than likely recipients even. Obey the Spirit promptings. Number four, pray and anticipate opportunities. You know, Paul asked that people would pray for him in this regard. This is something I've, I've began quoting as I've been going to doors. Without praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bounds. That God would open unto us a door of utterance. That is something that we can pray uh, as, as we start our days or we think about things. You know, I remember one time when I was working uh, for a company up in West Fargo and, and uh, I had a, a colleague that was uh, uh, from another country and he was stateside. We, got, we, I, we had a good relationship 
uh, going. And occasion, every once in a great while, uh, I connect with him still. He lives over in Paris area, or, or I should say outside of Paris now. But I, I, I remember praying specifically, God, would you give me a door of utterance? Or, or you'd open a door for me to witness to him. And I remember we were going to fly to, uh, to Des Moines, Iowa from Fargo and then drive out to Ottumwa, uh, Iowa uh, to visit a factory there. And uh, we got checked in, and Fargo's not got a very big airport. It's pretty small. And we, we checked in there, and we, got, we had about an hour before our flight, so we went and grabbed a bite to eat at a little cafe there. And we sat down. Within five minutes, God opened a door. And we, we talked, and, and I had an opportunity to witness to him after that. And he, eventually, he visited a church there in Fargo. One time, he actually visited a church here in the Twin Cities back in the community center years ago. And uh, it, it was really neat to be able to have that opportunity. And as, he hasn't been saved yet, as far as I know. But I still pray that God would save him. And uh, that God would use that in some capacity. You know, we can pray for these opportunities. They are there. I think they're there, more there than we realize. It's one of those prayers I believe God will answer. But you have to be looking for the answer too. You have to be looking for the answer. You know, there's a saying that we, that we need to put feet to our prayers. And what that simply means is that we pray expecting God to do his part, but we are obedient doing our part. That's what James talks about in James 2.18. Yea, a man say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. And, and, and in essence, what we're talking about here, we pray and anticipate opportunities. We go looking for them. We are seeking them. And God opens up the door. We'd be surprised how much God would open up those doors if we prayed that way and if we saw them. To be honest, sometimes we're simply, we're not looking for them. We may even be praying for it, but we've got to be looking for them. You know, you've got to try the door somehow. And they will open. Not with everybody, but with the right people at the right time. Pray and anticipate opportunities. Number five, keep a prospect list. Keep a prospect list. Say, what's a prospect list? Well, it's just simply a list of people that you're trying to reach for Christ. Pray over them regularly and seek opportunities to witness, to start a Bible study, to invite to church. These are people you can reach out to once a week through various means, texts, a note, a phone call, maybe you see them every, I don't know, as an example. Or maybe, maybe it's somebody that you can periodically reach out to. I've got a list of people that I reach out to, periodically, and in some cases weekly. Sometimes I give it, I give it some time, but I'm constantly reaching out. Why? Because I want to see them come to Christ. And I, got a, I got a prayer list of people that, uh, of people, uh, that don't attend here that have visited or, or whatever the case might be or that I know uh, whatever the case and they're on my prayer list prospect list if you will if, if you are door knocking and you get some contacts that way and you get somebody who who uh, is willing to give your contact information for follow-up you know you can keep them on that list and keep after them and and so forth that's that's what we do with with people but our intention is simply this we want them to be saved and we want to be, we're the bridge between us and God and them. And, and keeping that list will, uh, I guess, keep us cognizant of the need around us. Who is on your prospect list? Maybe you don't have a written one. That might not be a bad idea, but who's on your mind? Who are those people on your mind? That, that you're, you're trying in some regards to make an effort. I know on Sunday, in our Sunday school class, we have people that, that have been asking for prayer over certain individuals. Some of them were family members. I would say that that was on their prospect list. That's good. I, I honestly truly believe that each one of us can have at least one or two or three or more people on that prospect list. There's no reason why we couldn't. And it doesn't, it's not asking a lot. It's just... Again, being soul conscious. Who is it that we're trying to reach? Who is it on that uh, God is leading us to try to 
try to get to Christ. Number six, practice. Maybe this will be a help. You know, if you, you say, I don't, I'm a little uncomfortable, I don't know what to say. Well, practice giving a presentation. <laughs> practice in the mirror, practice to your spouse, practice to your friend, practice to your dog. You know, they need Jesus too, amen? <laughs> I know some dogs don't go to heaven. <laughs> no, I'm not even going to talk about cats. That's another subject. Oh boy, it went flat tonight, didn't it? <laughs> But in all seriousness, I think it's good that we think through a gospel presentation. I know especially, I've had a few people ask me about, you know, what are some things you say at the door? You know, when, uh, what are some things? And, and a- after the course of time, I've, I've had a few different responses, and, and a lot of them are similar to where I've kind of got a little way in which I do it. There's other people that have other ideas, and that's fine. But... Um, I've, I've, I've kind of gone through my mind and tried to practice some of the things that I say. And does every one of them go sm- as smooth as I wish? No. <laughs> some of them just, it feels like, boom, this is a dead ringer. And other ones, I'm like, boy, I tripped over my tongue three times getting it out. You just, you just keep practicing. But I think one thing that would be helpful is just to think through a, a gospel presentation like that. If somebody says this, how am I going to respond to that? I think it's good also to have key verses memorized. Some of which, like 1 John 5.13, says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. I use that one almost all the time. It's one of my, that's the, usually the very first one I, I give out. Because that was the first one that was given out to me. I'll never forget that. When I understood I could know, and I didn't know that. I guess it means a lot to me, so that's why I use it a lot. You know, Romans 3.10, There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and it's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. John 3, 3. Jesus saith unto him, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know, these are just key verses that you can use. Sometimes people are, are gracious enough for you to open their Bible. That can get cumbersome. But if, if you only got a short time, to have those verses in your, in your mind and your heart would be a help. And I believe as you witness more regularly, you'll just simply get better at it. You sharpen, you know, with, with the way that you can respond to people's questions or, or comments. You know, I, just over the weekend I had, uh, I had an opportunity, well, I was down in Rochester and and uh, I had an opportunity with a guy, good, probably good 20, 30 minutes chatting with him. And, you know, he, um, he had grown up in a mainline denomination but had left it. In fact, his kids kind of brought him back to church, if he, as he put it. And he told me, you know, he, one of his biggest problems was he just had a hard time with believing the Bible was true because he said it was, it was written by men and how do we know it's not this? And we had a, we had a good conversation and... And, he, and he, by the time we were done, he said, you know, I'm on this spiritual journey. And, and, and you know, and he, he was real positive at the end uh, with me as far as some of the things I was able to answer for him. But, you know what, I, as I looked at that whole thing, you know, there were some things I wish I had answered better. I don't know about you, but I've had times where the verses just roll off my tongue. And I'm just like, boom, they, they're just like there. The Holy Spirit of God's given them. And other times... I'm just blocked. I have like mental roadblock. And then I step away from that conversation and I remember about four things I could have said. And it's just so frustrating. It's like, why didn't I get it? Well, you got to understand too, the Holy Spirit of God will lead you. And sometimes he leads you just to sip it. And sometimes he gives you a whole abundance of it. But practice, practice, practice will make you all the better. And if you make a mistake, and who hasn't, <laughs> it's okay. Just keep trying and learn from those mistakes. You can't fault a person for, for, for trying. It's better than somebody that doesn't try at all. I remember back in high school, we, we were playing a football game, and one of our safeties 
hit a man out of bounds. It was a late hit. It was a 15-yard penalty. But I remember our coach, he walked up and down, uh, up, the, up the sideline. He said, I can take one of those mistakes. It was an aggressive mistake. I'll never forget that. You had to know the, know the guy. You know, I can take that mistake because it was aggressive. It was, it was somebody who was active versus somebody, I think it's a greater mistake not to say anything at all or do anything at all. The more we witness, the more we practice, we'll have which will enable us to do better. Number th- seven, set a plan. I believe we should sow as we go, always being ready to reach out to someone. But another step in the right direction is to set aside some specific time in which we will commit to sharing the gospel. You know, if it's a, if it's a, a burden to us, we'll, we'll make time to do it, some capacity. Make some time to do it. You know, we, we have our Saturday outreaches here. It's not, I understand not everyone can make it and all the time. I can't make it every Saturday either, but maybe there's an evening, maybe there's a morning, but there's some time that we can reach, set aside where we're reaching out to someone. What gets planned gets done. And if reaching people is a priority in lives, then we'll make it happen. Set a plan. Kind of in line with that, number eight, set goals. You know, maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea for us to set some goals in reaching out to people. Hey, every person we reach out to, I tell, I, I told my, I tell my son this sometimes, or my children, I should say. You know, you, you, you're reaping heavenly rewards when you're doing this, buddy. You realize that? I'm not trying to be selfish in, in this capacity, but every time we reach out, all that is is we're, we're reaping some, some valuable rewards, and we're helping people get their greatest need met. And that's getting that message of redemption. And maybe today it would be a good idea for us to set some goals. Maybe set a goal of giving out 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 gospel tracts in a given week. You know, everyone did that. Boy, we'd be pumping. (laughs) We'd be getting out a lot of literature real quick. Maybe make it a personal goal that God would allow you to share your personal testimony with somebody new every week or multiple, you know, two, three, four, whatever amount. Maybe make it a goal to set aside an hour every week or more, depending on your situation, to reach out. And we had some goals when we started this church. My, my goal for about six, seven weeks was to knock 1,000 doors. Now, I, didn't do, I wasn't doing much else besides that. I wish I, I had that time now. But I hit that goal. And it, it proved to be very, very fruitful. And God really blessed that. Maybe just set some goals in which we can strive to hit to keep us active in evangelism. Because a church that does not evangelize will fossilize. Fossilize. Is that what we want? A fossilized dead church that nothing goes on, nobody ever shows up, people are more interested in not being here versus being here? No, we don't want that. We want a lively place filled with people that are seeking to make a difference in the lives of others. That's what we want, right? I would hope. I would hope. But we've got to reach out. We've got to make, every one of us has to make a difference. And we can. Honestly, if every one of us did some of these things, oh, we'd be booming with visitors, I'll guarantee it. We would be booming. We'd be booming. It's very easy to get complacent. It's very easy to get self-focused. I understand we all have lives. But why are we here? That's really what it comes back down to as individuals. Why are we here? We're here for him. And what's the biggest thing on his heart? Those out there that need to hear. We're part of that. That's why we're here. Obviously, that includes reaching our families. I'm not saying that isn't true and and things like that. But, you know, God really wants us to be outward focused as much as we can be. Christianity is an outward thing. 
It's not meant to be solely an inward. God meets the inward so that we can push outward. It, it's so easy to get complacent. It's so easy to be just comfortable in the spot that we always sit every week. It's very easy to get self-focused and concerned about, uh, about what's going on in our world. But honestly, I think we'll be a lot more happier, a lot more joyous if we make it our passion to reach somebody with that message of redemption. Have we found that yet? Maybe setting some goals might be a help. Well, number nine and finally, take your family along. Take your family along. I saw this graphic. I don't know who posted it. Maybe some of you saw this too. It, I, I'm doing. I'm going to do it in two parts. I don't know if this statistic is accurate or not, but but by looking at average churches, there there might be some legitimacy to this. It says 75% of kids left the church from 18 to 29. Why did 25% stay connected with Christ in that age? So what did the 25% do that the 75% may not have done. Hopefully you can see this. This was the bottom of the graphic. Number one, they ate dinner five, to seven, five of the seven nights a week as a family. Number two, they served with their family in a ministry. Number three, had one spiritual experience in the home during the week. Number four, entrusted with responsibility in ministry at a young age. Number five, had at least one faith-focused adult in their lives other than their parents. Now, I don't know if this is all accurate or not, but I, I saw that and I thought, you know, these are some good ideas. These are some very good ideas. You know, one of the great burdens I think a lot of us have for our children is that they would stay with the Lord when they get older because there are many that don't. Many, many, many that don't. And that's a constant prayer and burden of my heart for my own children. <laughs> and think about some of these things that are, that are suggested at the very least. Being involved. As parents, we are really discipling our children, aren't we? And what they catch is what we have taught them. And our children need to know that our souls are important to be reached. They do. Now, I can preach it from the pulpit. Sunday school teachers can teach it from their podiums. But our lives, parents, have to live it. Have to live it. They have to see that. It's important. You know, maybe through taking them out or having them involved. I took my son out here sometime, you know, just a week or so ago. And it was, it was interesting the questions that start bubbling out of his mouth that really I, it made me as a father very excited I'm like uh, that was I'm, I was glad for that I'll, I'll say this I, I kind of wish I had done a little more of this earlier but something that has been burdening my heart to do more with my own children is to have them with me and see some of this stuff you know I was my son was supposed to go on our missions trip to Ireland I was really disappointed that we weren't able to do that but I don't have to take them overseas to do it, do that kind of evangelism. I can do it right here, right here, right now, just like all of you. But take our family along. Nothing like raising up kids that would be soul conscious, right? But if they're going to be soul conscious, guess what we need to be as parents and future parents here, some of you. These are just some thoughts Hopefully it will stoke with us, stoke a greater soul consciousness within us. If it does in one person tonight, it'll make the difference for a lot of people. If it does in just a couple people here tonight, it'll do all the much more. If it does in every one of us, let me tell you something, it'll make a tremendous difference in our region. And we're not a large group here tonight, but if this group caught fire, it wouldn't be long and we wouldn't have places for people in this building. Right now we do. Let's try to fill them. Not so that we can be something, but that he would be glorified and that people get saved. And that they can be trained and to reach others the same way. Let's make that our heart tonight. Let's not get complacent. 
Let's not just be happy with our little chair. But let's be considerate that, you know what, there's somebody that this Sunday, some Sunday coming up, I could have right next to me. Or I'm going to try to have right next to me. Isn't it fun to bring somebody with you? It is. When you have a visitor with you. Or it's somebody you reached out to and they came to church. It's even better when they get saved. It's even better when they get baptized. It's, it's wonderful when they're serving. But we have to be soul conscious. It starts tomorrow with the opportunities God will give each one of us. May God help us to be faithful at it. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Tonight, pianists will play. And I just want to encourage us to be mindful of the Lord, how He may have spoken to our hearts tonight. Maybe, maybe tonight we just need to ask God to revive a fire of that within our hearts. Maybe we need to ask God, God, would you open the door? There's some, been somebody you've bothered me about. Would you give me an opportunity? You know, as a church, we that's why we were here. Obviously, it's to glorify the Lord. I, I get that. But part of that is, is getting the message out and reaching out and just getting that, letting that, that fire burn in our soul. God will, God will revive that. We want that. Set my soul fire. That's a great song. Being soul conscious. May God help us tonight. May God move us out of complacency, apathy, discouragement, frustration, disgust, whatever it is that hinders us. Maybe tonight you are being a good witness and you're trying your best. Thank you. May God honor your witness. May God bless you. you even lead one to Christ? Have you been faithful? You'll be honored. The Bible teaches that. May God help us tonight to burden our hearts, to reach out, to be a witness. We'll play through one more time. Set my soul fire. could do something for me, pray for me that not my heart would be set on fire. That I wouldn't shirk back. That I would have the boldness. That I would give utterance. The doors would open for me. I want to be a, a better soul winner. I want to lead more to Christ. I need His fire just as much as anybody here. May God's fire come. The decisions we make tonight make a difference in eternity. Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for your goodness and graciousness to us. Thank you, Lord God, for just giving us some instruction, Lord God. I pray that it was helpful and practical in some capacity. May you be glorified tonight, and may you really stir within the hearts of every person here, especially my own, your heart, for souls. May you break our hearts over those who are unsaved. May we, may we pray and may we seek. May we be used. May each, every person here and family here be able to lead somebody to Jesus Christ. And may that joy of a soul winner be put into their hearts. As you say in your word in the book of Daniel, that they will shine as a brightness in the firmament forever and ever. Those that lead people 
to Christ. Help us tonight, Lord God, to catch that heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for being here tonight. Just a couple quick things. I guess the big thing is the conference. Please be praying as much as you can as the Lord brings it to mind. And even if the Lord forgets to bring it to mind, you pray for it, all right? <laughs> Don't worry, he won't. But if you could please pray as much as you can and try to bring somebody with you. If you haven't invited anybody out yet, please invite somebody out. I sent out that text. Uh, I think most of you got it uh, with a card. I, I've invited several people out that way to the conference for whatever it w works out. But uh, we're just praying for a great week and uh, that God would use it to revive our hearts and, and uh, encourage whatever the needs are spiritually. And uh, looking forward very much to having uh, Bruce and Sammy here. Things kick off Saturday at 6.30 p.m. right here at, at the church. With that said, Saturday we do have outreach at 10.30 if you're able to come for that. And uh, looking forward to a great week ahead. So, Neil, why don't you come and close with a word of prayer if you could tonight. Thank you.